Welcome to Your Education Matters. Here you will find in-depth discussions about all levels of education presented by persons knowledgeable about the field. Here are data and analyses you have been looking for to help make your educational decisions. Benjamin Levin is Professor and Canada Research Chair in Educational Leadership and Policy at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, University of Toronto. His career is about half as an academic and half as a senior provincial civil servant. Dr. Levin is a native of the city of Winnipeg who holds a BA from the University of Manitoba, a master's from Harvard University and a PhD from OISE. As a civil servant, Ben Levin served as Deputy Minister for Education for the province of Ontario for approximately four years, most recently in 2008-9. Earlier, he was Deputy Minister of Advanced Education and Deputy Minister of Education, Training and Youth for the province of Manitoba. As an academic, he has published seven books, including two just out, More High School Graduates and Breaking Barriers, and more than 200 articles on education while studying and speaking on education issues around the world. His current interests are in large-scale change, poverty and inequity, improving high schools, and finding better ways to connect research to policy and practice in education. We are pleased to welcome Professor Ben Levin to Your Education Matters. Thank you for thinking about Your Education Matters. Hello, Dr. Levin. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you have written that educational research has insufficient impact on education policy, and I'd like you to discuss uh, with us why that is. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons why that's the case. Um, one is that there just isn't enough research in education in the first place. So um, the OECD has recently put out some data showing that uh, Although education in most OECD countries is two-thirds the size of the health sector, health research gets about 15 times as much support as education research. <clears throat> so we just don't have enough research in education. And what we have as a result is often too small scale, too partial, non-cumulative, and uh, also not very well communicated for policymakers or practitioners. But on the other side, uh, our school systems aren't really very well geared up to find, analyze, assess, share, and use research even where we do have good evidence. So education has a kind of a culture of, um, how will I put this? Education has a culture that believes that every person has to find their own way uniquely mm -hmm. and that we don't have lessons to learn from large-scale empirical knowledge. And so that the system isn't well organized to do that. Very few school systems, very few ministries of education actually, have a well-organized capacity to bring research to bear, to make it available to practitioners and to create the conditions under which practitioners can talk about how they can make use of that research in ways that are meaningful to them. Well, you've worked at the highest levels in a couple of provinces. Uh, do the ministerial staffs have the capacity to process the research information that's out there? Uh, it varies. Uh, in Ontario, we've done a lot of work on building that, so I think the province is much, much stronger in that regard than it was six or eight years ago. Many provinces, that's quite weak. Of course, when governments are under budget pressures, one of the first things that tends to go is research. Everyone wants to protect frontline services, and of course, frontline services are very important. But if we don't have the right supporting infrastructure, then we don't get the full value out of frontline services. And I'm wondering, you know, what type of credentials you need in your office. You were deputy minister. Uh, the credentials of the people that are working for you, so that they can process what is being done out there and, and turn it into mm -hmm. something that is, is usable. You know, I, I'm not so sure it's so much a credential as uh, both an orientation that people bring with them and then the structures that are put in place. So it, as in a school, um, teachers are interested in research. If the school organizes ways in which research is made available, in which it gets put on staff meeting agendas, in which principals talk about it, which is part of the daily way in which people go about their work, I think people will make use of it and then they will learn more about how to do that effectively. So a lot of it is about how it's built into the institutional fabric. Have you seen these systems developed and made permanent in any of the provinces? <clears throat> 
Uh, yes, I think uh, some interesting things have been done in that regard. And, I, you know, again, I'll, t I'll talk about some of the developments in Ontario, which I'm okay. most familiar with. Um, but uh, Ontario has recently established something called the <coughs> Knowledge Network for Applied Education Research. This is about 45 partnerships between researchers and practitioners, school districts, intermediaries in different areas of education, a wide variety of different topics, which connect the researchers and the uh, people in the system. What does research say to us? How do we interpret it? How can we use it? How do we need to adjust it to our own context? So that would be one instance. Uh, Ontario also has something called the Ontario Education Research Panel, which brings together, again, people from various sectors to talk about how we could get more value from research. There's an annual symposium that has about 500 people that come together to talk about, again, the connections. A and I want to emphasize here, this is not a matter of researchers know and practitioners should do what researchers know. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of a conversation uh, about what research has to say to practice. Well, I have read in some of your writing, for example, in Capin, that Ontario's made some progress in getting past uh, the worst of the conflict in the accountability matter. Were, were the things that you're discussing part and parcel of helping to reach some kind of reconciliation over how to do accountability? Uh, yes, you know, I think, I think accountability is a piece of improvement, but I think the idea that accountability by itself will drive improvement is wrong. We drive improvement by helping people get better at their work. Mm -hmm. We start with the idea that people want to be good at what they're doing. They want to be successful. They want their kids to be successful. And so then the question is, how do we organize to help people do that? And part of that is bringing research to bear. Part of it, of course, I think also is a, a reasonable kind of accountability system that gives us information on how we're doing and allows us to adjust our practice in the light of, uh, of changing performance. Well, that's no small thing. You know, I think Ontario has not received the attention it should for the progress you've made on that front. It's, you do seem to have been able to reach some sort of rapprochement between uh, teachers, government, uh, and the general population on this issue. Well, the Ontario strategy since 2004 has always been very respectful of teachers and other educators. You know, to me, it's so obvious that if you want better schools, you have to work with the folks in the schools, and that beating up on people is not a way to get better performance out of them, any, way that, any more than teachers get better performance out of students by telling them they're a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings. You start by assuming people are well-motivated, and then you work with them to help them improve their performance on the understanding that's what people want to do. Well, both in the U.S. and Canada, sometimes the education gets used as a wedge issue. Of course. And uh, that's what gets us down the wrong path, I suppose. Yes. Now, your native province of Manitoba has mm -hmm. had quite a good track record on avoiding that, of keeping kind of bipartisan relationship with education. It has. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of some of what we did in Manitoba when I was there. But what I would say about Manitoba is that uh, judging by what we can see about the performance outcomes, they haven't been quite tough enough about asking, are we doing the best we can do? And the danger on the other side is that we get so friendly with each other that we don't question enough whether we're doing everything we can do on behalf of kids. It is a matter of finding that balance about because the goal has to be to help every student be as successful as they can be. And so there has to be some pressure on the system in that way. But it has to be the right kind. It has to be what I would call positive pressure. Well, let's dig into that a little bit. So. Uh, you feel more of that's going on in Ontario, yes. so give us a little more of the specifics of how Ontario is raising that challenge and stimulating reform. Well, in Ontario, it's been, it's been very clear to every school that you have to be working on improving student performance, and not just the average level of performance, but also in reducing the achievement gaps. Those are the first two of the three big goals in Ontario. Better outcomes, reduced inequities in outcomes. The third one is increased public confidence, which is mm -hmm. also quite relevant to our conversation. So schools know, and schools in Ontario and districts are all looking at what are our performance metrics? How are kids doing? Are we getting better? Are we successful in reducing achievement gaps for kids in special ed or kids with, who have English as a second language uh, and other uh, groups like that? So schools feel a lot of pressure, but they don't feel the pressure of punishment. There's no idea that if you're not successful, we're going to beat you up or fire you or take something away or shame you in public. We don't do that because we start by saying we all want to be better. And if we're not performing at the level we want, then we need to help each other do that. 
Some of that, what we call shame and blame, though, doesn't even come from governments. You know, it comes from media and think tanks. Sure. And, uh, uh, why haven't they prevailed in Ontario? We've had a lot of that stirred up in British Columbia, and mm -hmm. I'm afraid to some degree they have prevailed. Well, How do you push back on media and think tanks setting the tone for the relationship? You know, the Ontario government uh, at the political level, I think, made a very clear decision, this government when they were elected, that that isn't what they're going to do. And, and, you know, I think the Premier and the various education ministers deserve a lot of credit for that because they just haven't gone down that road. They've been respectful of the partners and not just the teachers but also the parents and the kids they've been respectful of all the partners all the way through it and a lot of work was done with media outlets in Ontario to try and uh, soften some of that but of course we also have another story to tell which is the story of improving performance more kids graduating mm -hmm. from high school more kids learning to read and write effectively and so that's also a counter a bit of a countervail to that. So when you pressure. say public confidence is one of the three legs on the stool you really mean they're active and Yes. generating that. Absolutely, because if you don't pay attention to it, it doesn't happen. This is another really critical thing at the school level. A huge amount of public confidence comes from the way individual schools and teachers work with parents and kids. You know, we forget that and we think it's all about PR brochures and advertisements, but most of it is that on-the-ground relationship work that gets yeah, done every day. Yeah, I think we've day. seen the evidence of that in British Columbia. When we did have a strike about five years ago, six, six years ago, uh, parents did come out and support the teachers so the relationship when all else was said and done was deeper than what somebody read in the paper or heard on the radio. Basically all across Canada uh, parents have a lot of trust and confidence in teachers but not unreasonably they want to be assured that when they send us their kids we're doing the best job we can do to help those kids be successful. That's a perfectly reasonable expectation they have of us. Well, I find that very encouraging because uh, spending much of my life in the United States, you know, I didn't feel it was there and it was hurtful to everyone involved. There's a kind of streak of anti-intellectualism, I think, that gets caught up in it. Also, uh, I think uh, teachers are associated with a certain set of political values. They're associated with unions. And in the U.S. more than Canada, those are, to many people, unpopular places to be. Yes, although the, the idea that you can somehow improve schools by making teaching a less attractive job <laughs> is one that I find difficult to fathom. Well, you've probably been running into uh, the Finns and the others. Uh, these societies where teachers are really so respected mm -hmm. and uh, occupy such a prestigious place in society, it's very touching and inspirational to me. Yes, although I would say for in all the professions, people are more and more questioning of all the professionals. And in fact, you could argue that's an outcome of education. Mm -hmm. We sent people to schools so that they could ask those questions. Now we're a bit sorry maybe that we did it in some <laughs> ways. But if you, if you talk to physicians, for example, they'll talk about patients who now come in with 50 pages of research from the internet yeah. questioning their decisions. So I think in all the professions, we now have to expect to be questioned and we have to expect to be called to account and have good reasons for our practice. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's actually a good development. Uh, but it can be done in a respectful way, of course. I understand. Thank you, Ben. We'll be back in a moment. When I arrived at SFU, I was ready. Ready to pursue my dream to become a physiotherapist, which all started back in high school with my passion for athletics. But then I took a health sciences course and discovered that at SFU, you have choices, incredible choices. It opened my eyes to a world of possibilities in global health. Possibilities for my future I had never considered, but I really struggled with letting go of my first goal. And that's when I found out how much support you get here. Incredible support, so you can really explore all those choices, think them through, and choose the path that's right for you. Faculty and staff paved the way for me and helped me navigate my new path, and I've never looked back. At SFU, you're part of a real community. The faculty and staff know who you are, what your interests are, and they really go out of their way for you. Research projects, conferences, international studies, co-op positions, student leadership. At SFU, you get the best education you could possibly hope for and the most support you could possibly ask for. And now that I've graduated, I'm packing my bags for Oxford to start my master's degree. Here's my plan. I see a need for better bridges between ideas and action in global healthcare. 
And if I can help build those bridges, that would be a really fantastic thing to do. I'm ready, and if you put your mind to it, you'll be ready too. Ben, you write about students being deeply affected by poverty and how that impacts on the performance of students in school. On the other hand, some people say that's just an excuse educators use for not performing mm -hmm. at the highest level. What's your response to that? Well, it's a very tricky issue because uh, I would say both sides of that debate have some merit. So on the one hand, we know that socioeconomic status poverty is the single biggest predictor, not only of education outcomes, but all life outcomes for young people. This has been established in a huge number of studies. It's, it's very well um, known and uh, defended fact in education. On the other hand, it does not follow from that that there is nothing schools can do. So while I would say we, schools don't create problems of poverty, they shouldn't be blamed for them, and they are not single-handedly going to resolve them, uh, I'd go on to say there is probably more that we can do in schools than we often recognize. It's a very difficult issue for educators because educators feel overwhelmed by the challenges many young people bring to school with them. I understand that. It's, it's very challenging. And yet at every level of socioeconomic status, we see in every country big differences in performance between some schools and other schools, which suggests that there is more we could do. So my view of this is it's two-pronged. We have to absolutely work on the issues that are out of school, on decent incomes for people, decent employment, decent housing, health care. Those things are critical to children's education welfare. At the same time, we have the children we have, and our job is to educate them to the best of our ability and to the best of our ability and to be very careful that we are not using uh, those real factors such as poverty as reasons not to be as effective as we can be. Something I notice here in British Columbia is that the uh, economic levels in housing are mixed. The zoning requires <coughs> when you do a development mm -hmm. you do different tiers of housing levels. Where in the U.S. to me, in my observation, that was little done. How about in Ontario? Are different social classes economically mixed by requirement of zoning? Uh, well, sometimes in some projects, but actually the, the evidence on Toronto is that n residential neighborhoods are getting increasingly segregated both by ethnicity and and socioeconomic status. This is work done by a U of T colleague named David Holchansky. And it's, it's really quite worrying that uh, our neighborhoods are less mixed than they used to be. Yeah, uh, to me, uh, I lived in Fresno before I came here, and we had 22 elementary school districts out of our 80 elementary schools. But those 22, everybody oh. in them basically was free lunch. Mm -hmm. So we had such a concentration of poverty in one part of town that I just wonder how a kid would ever get to believe they could succeed. They weren't seeing those success stories around them. Right, and one of the interesting things we know about neighborhood effects uh, I'm in a session on that at the conference here in a couple of days. But one of the interesting things we know about neighborhood effects is that kids with similar backgrounds, their performance will vary depending on the social composition of the school as a whole. Which is another reason to recognize that individual student background is not destiny. Mm -hmm. It can be altered. It is altered for many people. And that's why it's really important for educators, as hard as this is, to maintain optimism and not to lower our expectations for children under the best of intentions, because we see how kids are struggling, we see how, kid, how hard their mm -hmm. lives are, and our response is to lift our level, to reduce our level of demand yes. on them. We do it out of good intentions, but it has the wrong effect. I started my own teaching career in Appalachia, in a school where I had 43 kids in a class, six <laughs> classes a day, and out of all those students, I could see that there was one that clearly was headed to college, and generally I didn't think uh, very, maybe nobody else would go, and about a third of them were waiting to be 16 to quit school. In a situation like that, it pulls everybody's expectations down. Yep. It's pretty irresistible. Yep. On the other hand, here in British Columbia, I feel like I could go in any school in the province and feel good about that school, something I could never say in an American setting. Well, Canada has a much more equitable uh, education system than the U.S. does, That, for a whole variety of reasons related to district organization, related to funding, related to governance, and related to public values. But of course, that's true of everything between the two countries. <laughs> uh, the United States is willing to tolerate a much higher degree of inequity in basically every sphere of life than uh, Canadians have been, so far at least. Yes, the, I don't know if Canadians realize the ratio of funding between the low-funded and high-funded districts. It could be three to one, five to one. 
Right, and in this country you will find, by and large, the districts that are spending the most money are the districts with the highest need level, yeah. so it's exactly the reverse. And even then the gaps, the, the, the gaps are not as big. So some of these structural things that aren't necessarily associated with classroom interaction, like zoning and mixing housing and school funding, uh, those have a big impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You talk also in your writing about outreach to parents and communities. So what specifically do you mean by that? Well, it's, that is perhaps most important for the kids who face the biggest challenges, that, that we need to find ways to reach out to those parents and help them learn how to support their young people. And let me give a very concrete example of um, immigrant families. So the parents may not speak very much English, and they come with the idea that they should not teach kids their native language because the kids should just learn English, which is an idea, by the way, we used to encourage in schools. Well, we now have a lot of research, coming back to that point, to show that the best thing parents can do is read to their kids in any language and that there is absolutely no harm and indeed a great deal of benefit if you're a parent whose native language is Urdu or Mandarin or whatever it is, to read to your kids, to speak to them and to work on literacy in that regard. That will help your kids learn English. That's a message that we need to give parents, but of course we're going to have to give it to them in Urdu or Mandarin, not in English. Is it growing in Ontario, that type of school? Are there other ethnicities uh, developing those really, sorts of really, Not really. It hasn't yeah. grown very fast. You know, the, the, the number of these, these uh, experiments get a lot of attention, but the point is they're not mainstream. We could take charter schools in Alberta, which is another example, got a huge amount of attention. And, you know, 18 years later, instead of 10, they've got, I think, 13 now. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that Alberta's very high quality school system is not because they have charter schools. That's a bit that works for a small number of kids and parents. I think it's okay. Uh, but we really need to be focused on every school being involved in trying to be as good as it can be for every child. Well, that uh, leads me to want to explore a little bit with you the notion of inequity versus inequality mm -hmm. and how you parse that, because that gets mm -hmm. down to some of our basic values. And in the education field, we're all about values. You can't uh, start the school day without starting to For sure. demonstrate your values. So how do you think the schools should distribute themselves and their priorities on inequity versus inequality? Well, I'm not sure I entirely understand the distinction you want to make, but I would say that um, I would say that if we assume that groups of students have roughly equal distributions of talent and ability, then we should be working towards situations in which the outcomes across different students, groups of students are roughly equivalent. We're very far from that. So we don't necessarily need to know what the endpoint will look like. What we do need to know is where we are now. We still have very large inequities for Aboriginal young people and for other young people. We know something about what to do to make those better, and that's what we need to work on. And as things improve, well, we'll have another set of discussions about what's the next step, but we're not well, there Well, I yet. think a key element in the d discrimination is <clears throat> how much you work to compensate for what <clears throat> is, could be perceived as uh, uh, loss of resources in the background. Mm -hmm. you know, whether you feel it's the obligation of the, the school and the government to compensate for those or whether you feel it's enough just to put everybody on a level playing field to compete. Oh, well, uh, my view on that is, is very clear. Um, if we think about this as a matter of what does every child need to develop and be the kind of person we all want them to be, then I think the answer just falls out of that, that some children need more than others. So, you know, children who are physically disabled need wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. We don't say, well, unless everyone can have a wheelchair, you can't have one. <laughs> uh, and that should go with everything we think is, a, is an important learning need within, of course, the parameters of what we're able as a society to provide. We can't provide everything everybody wants or might need, but we can do pretty well. And how well do you think we're doing? Well, by international standards, Canada is one of the highest performing and least inequitable countries in the world. If you look at the PISA data, that's what it's consistently shown, very high performing and relatively low inequity. Uh, but if you look at what we know about the inequities in Canada, they're still far too big for anybody to feel comfortable about. And do you think generally we're headed in the right direction? Um, I think at any, I'm an optimist, I think at every, any given moment there's good potentials and bad potentials. There's certainly some things in the education scene in this country that I find worrying, but there are a lot of other things that I think are really positive. We have really skilled educators, we have a strong ethic of good education for all children in this country. 
Um, so those are very good things that we can build on. But there are always risks and dangers, and one always has to be involved in that struggle, uh, the political struggle of what is it we need to do to keep moving in the right direction. Well, I always find talking with you and listening to you encouraging and informative, Ben, and I thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. We'll be back in a moment. Words, it has been said, are the repository of our experience. Although in many cases, words are a pale imitation of experience, they are often vital for moving the human condition forward by allowing us to share an idea, however imperfectly. The extent to which we are able to be clear in our language is often the extent to which we are able to establish a concept or value in our community. Some words are to me especially valuable. They anchor an entire worldview of morality. As I watch our politics play out and observe how the lives of individuals are affected by policies we make, certain words surface for me. Some governmental policies play fast and loose with the fundamental security and well-being of people and their families, particularly those with limited economic means. We have seen medical care, public schooling, pensions, the criminalization of behavior, even war and peace treated as wedge issues and manipulated for political or economic gain. When proven wrong, those responsible rarely apologize or seem to feel guilt or shame. There is a word for the virtue that is lacking in such people. The word is a Roman one, gravitas. It suggests seriousness about the value of human life and compassion for human suffering. It demands profound respect for the values that define human beings as separate from the cruelty of the state of nature. We protect the weak, we cherish children, we bury the dead, we alleviate suffering, we respect each human life. You see the lack of gravitas in our politics when we carelessly manipulate or experiment with the institutions and laws that protect the vulnerable, young, old, impoverished, or sick. We especially need gravitas among our educators and other human service professionals. When you see teachers and others acting out of a sense of seriousness about alleviating human suffering, support them, speak out for them, Thank you for thinking about Your Education Matters. Visit our archive and see past programs at youreducationmatters.ca.